G'day, Starlo here with another episode of Cutting Edge Fishing Wisdom. The subject of introduced or exotic fish species in our waterways is always guaranteed to generate some heated debate. Why are carp bad and trout good? And what about species like redfin perch, tilapia, peacock bass or even Nile perch? I hope this episode challenges you to think outside the square and perhaps even question some of your long-held beliefs and assumptions surrounding these issues. It's a really interesting game to imagine how this vast continent of ours might have looked, felt, smelt and sounded a thousand years ago. A lot would obviously depend on exactly where the imaginary time machine deposited you. I suggest that there are parts of the Kimberley, Arnhem Land, the Great Australian Bight, Cape York and even the wild west coast of Tasmania where it would be almost impossible to detect any significant changes across the course of that millennium. Perhaps the absence of jet contrails high up in the sky, boats on the distant horizon or pieces of man-made plastic flotsam washed up along the shoreline might provide a subtle clue. In other locations, from Sydney's deep natural harbour to the floodplains of the mighty Murray River and far beyond, the contrast between then and now would obviously be stark and dramatic. But I must say, wherever I landed a thousand years ago, I'd want to have a bait caster and a spin outfit with me, as well as a bulging tackle box and a heap of spare line and leader. I bet there are few among our ranks who haven't daydreamed of flicking a lure into waters untouched by white man or his nets, dams, irrigation pipes and insidious pollutants. Can you just imagine it? Of course, the other set of ingredients that's radically changed across those 10 centuries is the inventory of flora and fauna present on Terra Australis and swimming in its waters. Some critters that were thriving here in 1022 are no longer to be found, while many others have arrived since and either firmly or tentatively established themselves here. Almost without exception, those new arrivals reached our shores thanks to human intervention, deliberate or accidental. And almost without exception, they've had an impact, usually negative, on Australia's native flora and fauna. But hang on a second, what do we actually mean when we say native? Over truly vast periods of time, well beyond the thousand years I asked you to imagine, the animal and plant population of any tract of land or water shifts and evolves. Species arise, thrive and then often decline or are displaced by competition and changing conditions. Where possible, they might migrate from one region to another, seeking new territory, especially as sea levels fluctuate and the climate alters over the eons. Very few places, even isolated islands surrounded by wide, deep expanses of ocean, are immune from the regular arrival of new species from other parts of the planet. Birds, bats and insects fly or are blown in, seeds float there, small mammals and reptiles drift in aboard logs, fish swim. (laughs) It's a jungle out there and it's very hard to stop the inmates from moving around. So what actually comprises a native species endemic to a particular location? Is it something that evolved there? Something that arrived millions of years earlier and has adapted to suit its new home? Or an organism that's been in a place for thousands of years? And if it's the latter, how many thousands of years? The best quasi-scientific definition I could find had this to say, quote, A native species is indigenous to a given region or ecosystem if its presence in that region is the result of only local natural evolution. End quote. However, even this source went on to mention that the caveat with no human intervention is often added to this accepted definition these days, which is all a bit confusing. (laughs) Australia's dingoes provide a very good example of the grey areas in this debate. Dingoes are directly descended from very similar canines found in China, on the Malay Archipelago and in New Guinea. They were almost certainly introduced to the Australian mainland with direct human intervention, perhaps during trade between our indigenous inhabitants and Asian seagoing populations such as the Macassans, or through human migration via the islands of Torres Strait. 
The scientific fraternity still argues about exactly when this introduction occurred. According to some, the earliest undisputed dingo remains found on Australian soil date back about 3,500 years, while others claim that genetic analysis pushes their arrival back to at least 8,000 years. Either way, are dingoes native to Australia or an introduced species? What do you reckon? At least as intriguing and thought-provoking as those questions about dingoes are the ones surrounding the origin of the distinctive fat-trunked boab trees found in our Kimberley and Top End. These amazing trees trace their origins directly back to Africa, and debate rages within the scientific community about how and when they first arrived on Australian soil. Did they spring from nuts that drifted across the Indian Ocean hundreds of thousands or even millions of years ago? Or were those nuts brought here by migrating humans, perhaps as part of the whole out-of-Africa expansion of Homo sapiens? (laughs) The jury's still out on that one. At the risk of getting into a debate that's well above my pay grade, it's also intriguing to hypothesise over the status of Australia's Indigenous peoples themselves the very same people who probably adopted dingoes as semi-domesticated camp followers had about the same time the pharaohs were ruling Egypt. Our First Nations people likely arrived on this continent at least 50,000 years ago and perhaps as much as 75,000 years or even more. Despite clearly using human intervention, their own, to get here, I think it'd be a brave and rather foolhardy observer who tried to claim that our First Nations people aren't native to Australia. Push that argument to its ultimate conclusion and stick doggedly to the local natural evolution definition and perhaps the only place on earth where humans could truly be classified as native are a couple of valleys in Africa. What's less open to debate is the fact that the first Australians significantly transformed both the landscapes and the flora and fauna of this ancient continent over time. Their regular controlled burns of the bush replaced less frequent but far hotter fires generated by random lightning strikes and other natural causes in the eons prior to their arrival. In places, these first Australians likely planted and watered the grasses that they and the prey they hunted relied upon for food, while limiting the spread of less useful plants, thus producing and maintaining extensive open grasslands. They built complex fish traps in waterways that altered the flow regimes of those streams and actively hunted a wide array of wildlife perhaps accelerating the extinction of some forms of megafauna, like the giant wombat-like Diptrodon. They may even have translocated fish species from one waterway to another. Again, members of the scientific fraternity differ in their opinions over the details, but all agree that vast areas of Australia were inexorably transformed across the millennia as a direct result of human activity. Obviously, the impacts of human activity accelerated spectacularly following the arrival of European colonisers on our shores at the end of the 18th century. In the 250 years that followed, we've radically altered this continent, not least by shipping in a veritable arc load of foreign organisms from dung beetles, European honeybees, cattle, pigeons and pine trees to cane toads, prickly pears, blackberries, lantana and Arabian camels. In most instances, plants and animals from other parts of the world were brought here because we humans perceived some sort of benefit in having them, while others simply hitchhiked or stowed away on our various modes of transport. Via both pathways, they've come and continue to come in their tens of thousands of varieties, completely transforming and reshaping the continent we call Australia. While it's lovely to daydream about how this continent might have looked a thousand years ago, that horse, or perhaps giant carnivorous kangaroo, has well and truly bolted. I suspect that only the most extreme and blinkered of modern-day preservationists would seriously advocate for any sort of return to a mythical Gondwana land, one free from all the changes that have taken place since the arrival of man, either the black man, 40 to 80,000 years ago, or the white man, 250 odd years ago. There's also the stark reality that if we all somehow managed to move out, (laughs) someone else would quickly move in.
Rather than such pipe dreams of magically returning to an impossible primordial paradise, most of us accept the pragmatic reality of what is and ask simply what we can do to make it better, perhaps by working to repair some of the more obvious wrongs wrought upon this ancient land. Clearly, there's flora and fauna we've imported to this country, willingly or otherwise, that's inflicted horrendous damage on our environment and the wildlife we share it with. Damage that far outweighs any small benefits these life forms might possibly offer in return. Two glaring examples are cane toads and the gambusia or mosquito fish. Both were deliberately introduced during the 1920s and 30s as supposed biological controls for other pests, cane beetles and mosquitoes. Both proved spectacularly unsuccessful in having any impact on the pests that they were intended to destroy, but they went on to become absolute ecological nightmares themselves. Given a chance to somehow wind back the clock and do things differently, I doubt there's any sane person who'd argue in favour of liberating cane toads or gambusia on our continent. However, with many other imports, the arguments are far more complex and nuanced. What about sheep and cattle? In retrospect, we may have been better off, environmentally at least, if we'd chosen to farm kangaroos, emus and other native fauna on this land of extremes. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. But that didn't happen. Instead, our nation rode to wealth on the sheep's back through the first half of the 20th century before mining grew to fill that same niche. How many of us would choose a different path if we were given a do-over? But let's get back to fish and look at a couple of really interesting experiences. Back in the 1970s, when I first began writing for fishing magazines, there was a good deal of talk about the possibility of introducing Nile perch into Australia, specifically to populate some of the new dams that were being built across Queensland. It was recognised that Barramundi couldn't reproduce in these impoundments. The closely related Nile perch happily breeds in freshwater, and it seemed like the perfect replacement as both a sport and a food fish, with huge potential benefits to local economies. I believe that small numbers of live Nile perch were even shipped here to be studied at the Walkerman Research Station near Lake Tinaru on Queensland's Atherton Tablelands. It might surprise some listeners and viewers to learn that one of the major proponents of introducing Nile perch into Queensland's dams was none other than my childhood idol and the doyen of Australian outdoor writers, Vic McChrystal. In fact, Vic's enthusiasm for bringing Nile perch to Australia was one of the very few things I ever disagreed with him about. To me, it sounded like a truly terrible idea. Later, we learnt that Nile perch could tolerate much cooler waters than barramundi and would likely have spread over time to systems like the Murray-Darling and well beyond, with dramatic impacts on species like Murray cod, yellow belly and silver perch. Stories also emerged of negative impacts the introduction of these giant perch had created in places like Lakes Victoria and Kyoga in East Africa, well beyond their natural range. In these lakes, the perch wiped out or dramatically reduced stocks of small forage fish like capenta, which the local human population had long relied on for food. Far from being able to easily switch to Nile perch to supplement their dwindling food supply, the locals found these big introduced predators both scarce and hard to catch, especially using traditional methods. And when they did finally manage to secure one, its sheer size made handling and storage especially without refrigeration, (laughs) almost impossible. They could hardly dry a 20 kilo fish in the sun as they'd done for centuries with the sardine-like capenta. Such are the far-reaching, unforeseen and sometimes insidious knock-on effects of our actions that many people in these parts of the world ultimately turn to cheap imported tinned fish to fill the hole left in their diets by the introduction of the Nile perch. The very same tinned mackerel and other marine species now targeted by a growing fleet of super trawlers that have begun adversely impacting fishing grounds right around the globe. Talk about the butterfly effect. Anyway, in the end, the large-scale production of hatchery-bred barramundi filled the need for big, desirable sport fish in those Queensland dams. The Nile perch proposal was wisely shelved and the sample specimens in the tanks at Walkerman were killed and disposed of. Now, I can already hear a few strident cries of dissent 
Imagine if Vic and the other proponents of the proposal had achieved their goal and we'd ended up with Niall Perch. They can grow to 100 kilos. How fantastic would that have been? 200 pound barra. (laughs) And so what if they made it into the Murray Darling? They'd have gone through the bloody carp like a dose of salts and also provided a superb fishing opportunity for southern anglers. (laughs) Sadly, things are rarely quite as clear cut as that. Waters tend to be able to support a certain biomass of fish regardless of the shape, size, species and number of individuals within that biomass. So I guess you can have your pick between a couple of thousand capenta or one Nile perch or between a dozen or more yellowbelly or a couple of decent Murray cod or that same Nile perch. There's also no guarantee that the African fish would have tolerated our extreme climate cycles over the longer term nor thrived after they decimated the base of the food chain. The results of their introduction could well have been catastrophic. There's a good chance we'd have lost a big chunk of our native fishery and ultimately had very little to show for it in return. But interestingly, a little over a century before the Nile perch debate, another group of dedicated proponents succeeded in introducing the fish of their dreams in the form of trout. So let's have a look at them. The recent La Nina climate cycle produced much wetter and cooler springs and summers than is typical for a large portion of southeastern Australia. One result of this pattern was a significant boom in our trout fishing fortunes, especially in the higher altitude regions of New South Wales and Victoria, as well as right across the island state of Tasmania. Just a few years ago, in the face of fire, drought and record high temperatures, I was wondering out loud if our mainland trout fisheries actually had much of a future, especially in some of the more marginal regions like the New England and the central west of New South Wales. But for now at least, these speckled immigrants have been given a major reprieve. Many anglers who should know such things claim that we're currently enjoying some of the best trout fishing witnessed in at least a generation. I've got no reason to disagree, (laughs) having experienced some wonderful trout action myself across the past few seasons. I've been loving it. But it's also interesting to note a grassroots shift in the attitudes of some, fishers and non-fishers alike, towards trout. Whenever I make a Facebook or Instagram post showcasing trout these days, I can bank on attracting at least a couple of negative or even derogatory comments from folks who regard these introduced fish as unwelcome ferals or pests, very much in the same ilk as carp, tilapia, gambusia or redfin. Trust me, I absolutely get it. At one level, these critics are technically correct. Old world salmonids didn't even exist on this continent until 1864, when some very determined and enterprising individuals finally managed, after a string of failed attempts, to successfully transport fertilised brown trout and Atlantic salmon eggs around the globe and across the equator from Britain to Tasmania, packed between slabs of ice and layers of damp moss buried deep in the holds of creaking, leaking sailing ships. The sheer effort and ingenuity involved in pulling off this seemingly unlikely feat is worthy of all the books and articles that have since been penned about it. But before we wax too lyrical about the wonderful achievements of those early acclimatisation societies, it's probably worth noting in passing that they also brought us rabbits, hares, foxes, several types of deers, sparrows, starlings, uh oh, and yes, both carp and redfin perch, as well as roach, loach, tench, and a few more shady characters from the fish world. In fact, some enterprising acclimatisation society members were apparently rather keen to see giraffes, monkeys, yaks, and various other exotic beasties roaming freely across the Australian landscape. <laughs> After all, their organisation's motto was, if it lives, we want it. <laughs> With an ethos like that, what could possibly go wrong? As already mentioned, there's no denying that every animal and plant ever introduced into Australia has had some impact, mostly negative, on our native flora and fauna. That goes for trout too. While arguably nowhere near as devastating as many other introduced species, trout have definitely had regional impacts on populations of smaller native fish, such as our unique galaxids and Australian grayling, as well as certain invertebrates and perhaps most worryingly of all, some of our more vulnerable native frogs, which are already under serious attack from an insidious fungus disease, as well as other introduced predators, such as those gambusia or mosquito fish that I mentioned earlier. 
That said, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that other introduced fish, including both carp and gambusia, have had a far greater negative impact than trout without offering the same benefits, both social and economic, that trout have clearly provided. Carp, in particular, completely alter and effectively re-engineer many of the environments they now thrive in by muddying up the water, destroying aquatic vegetation, eroding and undercutting banks, and displacing other species. Not to mention acting as vectors or hosts for destructive diseases and parasites like lanier or anchorworm. To my mind, the negative impacts wrought by carp Gambusia and tilapia far outweigh any possible benefits they might offer to us in return. With trout, the argument's a bit less clear-cut. Obviously, mine's a highly subjective, biased and human-centric assessment of the relative worth of such critters, and I accept that. Consciously or otherwise, we all have to make such value-laden decisions every single day about that ark full of animals and plants that we've shipped into the Australian continent across the past two and a half centuries. Cattle, sheep, horses, dogs, chickens, pigs, wheat, corn, barley, potatoes, apples, strawberries, the list is massive. In the end, for most of us, I suspect it boils down to drawing up some sort of imaginary ledger of good versus evil or benefits versus costs, and then deciding where we place each imported organism on that list. I think we can nearly all agree where cane toads, gambusia and prickly pear sit on that scale of worth, but things become a little less black and white when dealing with the likes of goats, horses, camels and trout. The irony of it all is that if there were no trout living in Australia today, and proponents were now arguing in favour of importing them, (laughs) I'd likely be as opposed to that notion as I was to the introduction of Nile Perch back in the 1970s and 80s, or the crazy ideas sometimes voiced and even acted upon about deliberately introducing peacock bass into our waters. Today we know better, or we should, but with trout it's a done deal. They've been here for 160 years. That's about 70 or 80 generations of trout. More unbroken Australian lineage than most of us non-Indigenous humans can claim. There's even good reason to believe that our trout have adapted and evolved to some extent to suit local conditions. (laughs) Perhaps it's time we simply granted them citizenship and moved on. In fact, I'm told that a group of keen trout anglers got together and conducted a mock ceremony to do exactly that a decade or so ago. (laughs) You've got to admire their initiative and their cheek. Redfin or European perch provide a classic demonstration of the complexity of this debate. Lots of people, myself included, really enjoy catching and eating these attractive freshwater exotics. However, every redfin I land gets dispatched, even if I don't intend eating it. To me, they are and always will be a pest fish. That's due to their voracious predatory impact on other species, their role in spreading an insidious disease called EHNV, and their propensity for overpopulating and stunting, thereby diminishing any possible benefits they might offer. But I do accept that some of the same arguments can also be levelled against trout. So yes, I know, it's complicated. There's also the whole vexed question of domesticated versus feral, Cats, dogs, pigs and horses can be wonderful things in the right places and ecological nightmares when they're allowed to run rampant on the landscape. I accept that some people apply similar thinking to trout and maybe they've got a point. It just doesn't happen to be one that I totally agree with. I'll happily put my hand up and admit that I love trout and trout fishing. I've been lucky enough to chase varied salmonid species in seven different countries stretching from the bottom end of New Zealand's South Island to the far-flung Russian tundra well above the Arctic Circle. In some places, these fish were natives, and in others, like Australia and New Zealand, they'd been introduced. In all of them, they provided a valuable boost to local economies, as well as significant social, recreational, and even nutritional benefits to us humans. Whether that justifies their continued presence is something you'll need to decide for yourself. This whole debate is so incredibly subjective and riddled with contradictions and biases. It's one thing for someone like me to place trout at the good end of the imported fish spectrum, with carp and gambusia way down the far end under bad, and redfin somewhere in the middle. 
but I shouldn't, and I don't, expect everyone to agree with me. We're all entitled to our opinions, but we should also listen to the views of others and respect their arguments too. Above all, we need to be well informed, to listen to the science, and to keep an open mind as far as possible. As for me, it's all starting to make my head hurt now, so I'm going fishing. (laughs) Trout fishing, as a matter of fact. (laughs) Until next time, this is Starlow wishing you tight lines. (laughs) 